Hi, this is Yatsu of Animal Brands. And this is Yogev Shelley of DiniTab. And we are here to talk about advancement in education through NFTs. On the edge of NFT, the most educational podcast in the land. Keep listening. Hi, NFT curious listeners. Stay tuned for today's episode to learn how TinyTab is opening new doors for educators, students, and families to amplify learning opportunities and at the same time onboard them into Web3. And whether chat GPT is a threat or an asset to education, also whether chat GPT comes up with good podcast questions. And why today's guest would love for everyone in the world to know they can be as creative as anyone else. And don't forget, we put together a gathering called NFTLA just a few months back that brought out thousands of the world's most innovative doers in the NFT space. Head over to nftla.live to get tickets to our bigger, bolder, better, but also just as intimate and impactful event happening in Los Angeles, March 20th, 2023, 2023. See you there. Welcome to the Edge of NFT podcast with your hosts, Jeff Kelly, Ethan Janney, and Josh Krieger. We aim to bring you not only the top 1% of what's going on with NFTs today, but what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts and the business side, but also the human element of how NFTs are changing the way we interact with the things that we love. This podcast is for the futurists and dreamers, the disruptors and creators, the fans and connectors, and the makers and doers that are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. Today's episode features Yat Su, co-founder and executive chairman of Animoca Brands, and Yogev Shelley, CEO of TinyTap, both partnered to disrupt education through NFTs. A veteran of technology entrepreneurship and an investor based in Hong Kong, Yat Su is a global leader in blockchain and gaming with the mission to deliver digital property rights to the world's gamers and internet users, thereby creating a new asset class play and earn economies, and a more equitable digital framework contributing to the building of the open metaverse. Since 2018, Yat has been an early advocate for the use of blockchain and NFTs in the gaming industry, which will allow gamers to enjoy true ownership of their own game assets, data, and consequently, equity. With a clear vision of the potential of decentralized apps and assets, Yat quickly steered Animoca Brands to a leadership position in blockchain, gaming, NFTs, and the open metaverse. A lifelong creative, Yogev Shelley, founder and CEO of TinyTap, received his Bachelor's of Art and Design from Bezalel in Jerusalem. Then Yogev opened an interactive design studio as a means to pursue a content creation career, something he has carried with him ever since. He began to learn coding as a hobby, which would eventually lead to the development of the first iteration of TinyTap, a tool he first used as a way to engage with his ailing father who suffered from dementia. TinyTap back then was primarily used by Yogev himself, creating activities that centered around his family. Yogev used pictures and voice recordings to ease the symptoms of dementia. Teachers worldwide, though, found TinyTap on the App Store and began using it for similar means. They would build interactive lessons for their students to create fun and engaging material to use in class. This organic adoption of user-generated content inspired Yogev with a vision for the future. Today, TinyTap provides a code-free platform that empowers educators to create and share interactive educational content and to receive a revenue share when that content is used by learners. Welcome back to the show yet, and welcome for the first time, Yagev. Yeah, and you know, I think, Ethan, it's so uh, interesting that here we have Yat in Davos. You were just on Digital Davos yesterday, and we're, you know, the conversation in Davos that I think Yat was kind of catching us up on is all about the bigger impact on society of technology. And um, certainly education is one of those industries that's so ripe for disruption. Um, you know, people talk more about the challenges than the solutions. And here we have a really interesting solution to a big problem. Oh yeah, for sure. And and also before we get started, uh, I want to, to jump in and just share that our co-host, Jeff Kelly, he uh, shares his regret that he can't join us today. He's currently actually at a memorial service for a colleague who passed away unexpectedly, um, but uh, he wishes he was here to be with us today. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, shout out to to Jeff and and best wishes to, to him and his family and his colleagues' family as well. Um, 
But, you know, in regard to the, the conversation around education, um, yeah, give us give us a, a view at what's going on in in, um, in Davos this year besides uh, some snow. Well, I mean, first, my condolences to Jeff, uh, friends and family. Uh, but yes, I mean, maybe quickly in Davos, you know, I would say broadly speaking, uh, first of all, the mood is much more optimistic than I expected, which is good. I guess you could say that maybe people came in with some skepticism about how the market is. And then, you know, roughly towards the end of Davos, everyone was feeling quite good about themselves and, and the market overall. Not sure really what that comes from, but, you know, the conversations were positive. And I think there's a few macro things to consider that's adding maybe to that sentiment. Um, you know, not just sort of rising token prices, which obviously has been somewhat of an interesting development in, in, the, in, in the last week or so, is that I think, um, you know, there were two main, uh, really main topics that were driving over here at, uh, at Davos. One of them is obviously Ukraine. Uh, and if you think about what's happening in Ukraine, that's actually been sort of going in, the f in, in favor, I, I would say, towards sort of the general sort of market and Western sentiment. And I think that's obviously adding to the mood. But then the second one is it's the metaverse. And the metaverse is actually front and center in almost all conversations uh, in Davos, uh, main, main, main events. And in fact, just yesterday, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum um, basically announced sort of, you know, some of the metaverse findings basically with the Working Governing Council, uh, which we're a part of and we basically were part of the sort of release, uh, which by the way, the, the council members are, you know, on that one isn't just, you know, Web3 companies. In fact, we're a bit of a minority. It includes companies like Meta, and Google, <laughs> and Microsoft, and all our favorite names. So, so, so this is an interesting sort of conversation to write to write a bridge. But anyway, in any in any sense, uh, it was a positive uh, step there. And of course, the other thing is that in Davos, many of the side events were a lot of Web3, you know, crypto, blockchain type companies as well. So that was that was uh, you know um, it 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 may as certain sections of it may as well have felt like Web three Davos. So it was uh, it was actually quite quite fun. Yeah, we were we were there um, you know actually just six months ago. And there, if you have a chance, there's a vending machine in Davos where you can get yogurt, cheese, and sausage right out of the machine at any time of day. So so just a little FYI for you. <laughs> But but let's let's talk a little bit more broadly about um, you know the macro topics of that that like really this show comes together to to cover right we we have here you know a new form of sustainable ethical equ equitable capitalism um, that Animoca Brands cares deeply about that's one reason you're in Davos um, and it really leads into. Our, the rest of the focus of the show, which is on education and in particular in disrupting education, but but really just kind of paint a picture for us of this new framework of capitalism and and how you're going about approaching this. So we believe uh, in sort of in particularly this is why we're so excited uh, about Web three. Um, we believe in this concept of the sort of the shared network effect, and we've spoken often about how the metaverse and um, Web three and blockchain should be really viewed as building economies as opposed to sort of thinking of them of companies or business. And so like a country, right, the size of its GDP, the size of its economic growth has a net benefit generally to the whole population and everyone involved rather than basically benefiting just a few. But the problem that we have in the world today, generally speaking, is that capitalism is generally a form of shareholder capitalism, which is most embodied when you look at basically where the value accrues. So if your company is successful, then obviously the management does well, the founders do well, and the shareholders do well. But the customers who have contributed to the success of these companies, and this isn't necessarily just digital companies, but obviously digital companies are the ones who are probably best exemplified, um, basically don't get really outside of being a consumer of the service, don't get a benefit for having helped build the business. After all, you know, if you look at something, say, like Facebook, if people, you know, stop using Facebook, the value of Facebook is zero. And yet when the people who use it, the platform, uh, actually, uh, you know, they're mined for the data and they don't get any value for it. So it seems, you know, basically that really the consumer, and that's the term consumer, is really just there to be extracted right. from, right? And that's basically the kind of capitalism that we generally have today. Now with Web3, though, what is now possible, it's a form of true stakeholder capitalism. So it's not indirect, it's very direct. 
So if you take, for instance, one of our other properties, which is a sandbox, as an example, if you buy land at sandbox, you become a stakeholder in the truest uh, sort of sense of the word, which means that if sandbox does well, you do well too. If sandbox does poorly, well, you know, you suffer equally. But the thing is that what happens is, is the entire community has now a common sense of purpose because they are all part of that same stake, which also means actually you have a natural defense mechanism as we have in our own neighborhood, right? If our own neighborhood is going badly, the community will come together and say, what can we do here? So stakeholder capitalism isn't just how do we share value across the community. Stakeholder has capitalism, actually the word stake, means that everyone has something at risk. And we know what happens in societies when you have something at risk, when you are staking something, because you're not just staking money, you're staking reputation, you're staking basically things that are important to you. And when you have something at stake, then it's worth defending, and it's worth protecting. And so that's basically what we're hoping to continue build, to build here. And with the new data paradigm that's blockchain with, with Web3, actually every uh, sort of every, every, you know, what was traditionally customer consumer now becomes a customer owner. And as a result, that uh, customer owner basically has a, you know, shared purpose with the community that um, he or she is basically joining. Uh, so, yeah, we, we think that mm -hmm. is, you know, you know, broadly speaking, you know, what we're so excited about. And, and this is really only possible in something like, uh, like Web3. You can't really do that um, in, in the traditional sort of, you know, Web2 paradigms. For sure. Yeah. I mean, shout out to a, a book called Skin in the Game uh, by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, um, you know, relatively famous econom uh, sort of economist of sorts. Um, and that's kind of what the whole book is about. You know, how, how do we get skin in the game for various players and in various systems to, to make it most functional for all? Um, I also uh, thought it was interesting, you know, mention that word consumer. And, and then I thought of it in terms of something like Facebook or, or a lot of these social apps, right? We've turned consumers into producers. <laughs> they are producing the content. Uh, but like you said, it's extractive. Uh, so they're not just consuming, to be honest, right? Like traditionally, the concept of a consumer is someone who sort of takes and, you know, consumes whatever is being produced. And, and uh, in that case, they're actually uh, what you would think would traditionally be a consumer are producers in, in the most truest sense of the term. Um, I'd love to check in with you, uh, Yagav, um, just about what's going on here, you know, with, with, uh, with tiny tap and, and I want to know like how NFTs and web three technologies are improving earning opportunities, for example, for educators through the system. Yeah, of course. Um, I think I'm just going to build on what we've said until now. Um, yet I've also haven't heard uh, that that kind of focus and highlight on the word consumer. So that's very interesting to, to think about it. And I think web one is basically the right place to put consumers in because there we just consume the content. Maybe the web two should be about uh, producers and web three is about owners. So that's I think a nice way to kind of connect everything. And um, I'm going to talk in length about what we've created on TinyTap and how we're uh, basically advancing the vision that we already had before with Web2, but now we can really amplify with Web3. And uh, a big part of that vision, or maybe the starting point, the starting point of what we're building is the ownership part. It's to really give the creators the ownership of what they create. And by that, opening a whole set of new business opportunities and models for them. And as we were working on that, it really made it much clearer that owning the content is, is a much more fair and true way to link your success to a company's success than the traditional way we're investing in companies today or uh, taking part of companies. So if I want to, if I'm an avid Facebook user, meta uh, user, and I uh, I want to participate in their success, I can go to the public market and buy their shares, but we all know that has nothing to do with the actual success in terms of uh, traction and revenue of the company. It's more of a hype in market and the market can punish it. The actual underlying assets are where the value is at. So if I own a YouTube video, if I owned a, a part of a, the evolution of dance back then, then in, in YouTube, I don't know if viewers here know what I'm talking about, but any uh, successful videos that suddenly... Uh, 
didn't get a lot of views when the platform was young, but suddenly this platform becomes huge. And I was a part owner in that video. Then I enjoyed that success and it's linked directly to the success of the company. So in a way, I think owning pieces of content of platforms that we use and engage are a much better way to really link yourself uh, to the success of a company that you believe in than going to the public market. So I do hope mm -hmm. that's where we're going and that's what we're trying to advance also in education. Can you get a little bit into how this works? You know, there, there's actually another um, another business, which I don't know if it's necessarily a competitor, but there's something interesting about it that I've known about this company for years because my my wife and her sister uh, got involved in it. It's called Teachers Pay Teachers. Are you familiar with this? Um, so anyways, it's a, it's a platform where if you're a teacher and you made some PDF you know, thing, you can upload it there. Other teachers, you know, I'll spend $2, $5, whatever on this educational pack. And, um, and then it's just so much easier for that other teacher to use that content and so on and so forth. Um, they called it, they eventually started calling it teachers make millions, you know, because teachers <laughs> are actually making, you know, millions <laughs> by creating this content. How is that, you know, how's the model? I'm sure the model's a similar, different to that kind of a thing on your platform. Like what, what are similarities and differences there? So uh, we love teachers, pay teachers. Being, we've been in the um, connection with them for years and been uh, inspiring from them. I think um, that it's, it's also a testament to the fact that the current education system doesn't provide everything that teachers need and that uh, it relies on the creativity of educators. Um, what they do on, on teachers, pay teachers is allowing teachers to sell, interact, sorry, to sell lesson plans. PDFs, et cetera, to other teachers so they can use it in the classroom, which means a lot of the time when um, you send your kid to school, you just imagine that everything is there and ready for them to go. But actually there's a teacher that needs to come up with something creative and, and have it ready for tomorrow. And then she can, needs, she can use some other teacher's uh, resource. Um, it is teachers within teachers, and we really want to expand it to, uh, to teachers, to parents and teachers, to, uh, to students and, and, and learners on TANITAP because we're kind of leveraging the interactive aspect, which allows the consumptions of individuals at home. You said uh, teachers make millions. I think the, one of the biggest problems that we're trying to solve is that there's a lot of people who want to be uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, education. Mm -hmm. I have great ideas on how to do education differently. Basically, anyone who didn't enjoy the education system or uh, have other ideas on how to do that. But it's as yet can testify, it's super difficult to start an ed tech venture, to raise the funds for that, to reach the market uh, distribution. And not even all countries have an ecosystem for startup, et cetera. So it's difficult to be an entrepreneur. And that's why... Um, it is essential to go to Web3 and really help them find business models that can help them get funding and find business models that can help them get partners to distribute that. Because if you look into Teachers Speed Teachers and, you, and if you look at a lot of other platforms, normally it's the Pareto rules, it's 2080 or much less than that that are making the most millions. You know, you have like the, the top 10, 100 names who are making right. millions, the rest are great, creating great content, but have no idea on how to market that. And we see that on TimeTap as well. People create content, but then you also need to market and push that. And you need partners to join you. And to do international partnership with someone you don't know, normally you need agreements and you need laws and, and a court that can actually enforce that. And a lot of that is being solved with the trust that Web3 introduces here. Because mm. if there is a smart contract behind it that says that, both of us own a piece of content. Now you can, you, you don't even need to know me, but you know, and you trust the system that you will receive the funds when that content generates revenue. So in a way it removes so much of the friction and uh, that's what we're trying to build. I'll talk about it more as we continue. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if you had something to add there. I had a follow-up question, if not. Okay. Well, I mean, the question I have um I know you guys all have children and we're talking about a situation where education does need to evolve. And, and some of my friends with children this weekend, we we're hiking, we we're talking about um, the challenge of AI in, in chat BTG, in, the, the chat bot and its ability to sort of change the game in terms of doing research and, and writing papers and all these assignments that I got as a kid, people can do now in five minutes with, with some AI help, right? So um, 
you know, as you think about TinyTap and in other types of ways to gamify learning, are you also thinking about how to defend against AI and make sure people are actually enlarging their brains um, through education? Because that's my concern is that all these AI tools can can really, um, uh, you know, go against the, the 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 curve of actual pure learning. Chat GPT is is, is a marvel. Um, and yet, I'm not sure even that you're. I'm not even sure that you're uh, up to date on that. But we had a, already had a chance to integrate ChatGPT into TinyTap, and there's a, a very simple way where you can just ask the ChatGPT to create a game about the solar system, and you'll get a TinyTap game ready tomorrow. So we're trying to be friends with it, not push it away. Um, one of the uniqueness that we're bringing in uh, in, in the way TinyTap teaches people uh, that is. I think different, different from a lot of the um, tradi from the online edu educational platforms that we're familiar with, like Udemy, Coursera, etc., is that we're not just about videos and con and consumption of information. It's an active learning experience. You're asked a question. You need to participate. You need to use your brain. Sometimes, sometimes it hurts, uh, but you're a, a part of the lesson. You're not just uh, participating. So I think. If you're just asking questions or you're just uh, seeing videos, it's not enough. We want you to uh, to work your brain and participate and uh, and be a part of the lesson. And ChatGPT can be a great help in that. I'm, I'm about, playing with constantly. So yeah. So how about I'm this? Hearing... No, I'm, no, I'm yeah, sorry. So... I have. To, I got. I got to get this. I just checked. Uh, I just typed into ChatGPT. Give me a good podcast question to ask Yatsu of Animoca Brands. Let's just read it. We don't have to answer it, but I think it's okay. pretty good. Can you discuss the strategy and vision behind Animoca Brands' acquisition and development of popular gaming franchises such as Formula One, uh, Garfield, and Crypto Kitties, and how you see these franchises fitting into the overall growth and success of the company? <laughs> Hey, that's not bad. That is not bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. I think one of the, uh, I mean, as as you guys said, I think ChatGPT definitely sort of uh, sort of opened up people's sort of thoughts and opinions as to what AI can really do. And of course, there is one uh, sort of, you know, unfortunately, we've heard some stories about some sort of, you know, schools actually sort of banning ChatGPT, which actually I think is the wrong answer, right? Because really ChatGPT, if you think about it, can be a really strong ally in education. When you think about sort of, generally what AI can do. One of the struggles, and this is why TinyTap really sort of stood out here, was creating personalized content, you know, for individual learners that happen to be just different because we are all different as people. And so one of the challenges that, you know, and one of the reasons where many of us are sort of trying to sort of solve education is that we recognize that, you know, people aren't one size fits all. We don't all think the same. And therefore we don't all learn the same. And that's one of the reasons why a platform like TinyTap, you know, if you think about it, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of ways to learn English. Well, why do you need thousands and thousands of ways to learn English? Because we are just different, right? Uh, some people are visual, some people prefer this text, some people like it in pink, some people like it, whatever that may be. Right? And I think what something like an AI system will do is actually better customize your content for your needs, except whose content will it draw from? And actually, if you think about the derivative of that, you know, when you think about how did ChatGPT just ask me this question, they didn't just make it up. They had to draw it from somewhere. They searched Google, they analyzed people's, you know, podcasts maybe, maybe they found a way to see what people are asking. And that repository of knowledge is going to come from places like TinyTap. TinyTap, as the teachers create content, are going to basically draw. So in other words, it will be just the much, much better personalization engine. If I'm a kid or if I'm a parent looking for a certain kind of content through a number of queries, it'll pick out custom-made curriculums or custom-made sort of things coming from the content set that, you know, TinyTap created from the, you know, 100,000 plus, you know, educators and teachers that are already making unique content because the source of that knowledge is still human at the end of the day. And this is also why, by the way, I think Web3 and blockchain is so important because provenance matters now. Because if you're, you know, if, if, if you're drawing knowledge from someplace, how do you reward the actual creators of where that knowledge came from, right? If, if I'm now basically mix and matching this educational content that came from five different teachers, that's something an AI can put together. Now you can actually reward. If I own five of these different NFTs and it derives that knowledge, actually the AI can then basically share that value from the five different groups that basically it derived from. 
right? So there's, there's a lot of interesting sort of possibilities. So on one hand, it could be scary. But on the other hand, it could be an, represent an incredible opportunity to fairly distribute value for the sort of original content creators. Yeah, I think um, what you said and what Yogev said, I mean, the challenge is now on us to turn uh, reality into an active learning experience that that is hyper engaging for, um, you know, a, a very sort of technology driven um, younger generation. It's just it, it's there and it's ours to sort of do what we can with it. And in the process of all that, um, there's a massive amount of, of data that's out there that all these platforms are leveraging, and there's a network effect um, that, mm -hmm. that's coming, um, you know, of course, from information that TinyTap and other products are ingesting, and also that they're putting putting out there in the world. And, and I'm curious how you guys look at that sort of network effect in, in, in data um, in terms of this educational landscape. Yeah, so a uh, network effect is uh, the, the basis of TinyTap. It's been a community-centered platform since uh, we launched it. And um, Web3 kind of solves a lot of the... Web3 is super interesting for us because it, uh, it, it serves as a technology that allows us to do something that was actually more complicated to do without, okay? Um, so, for example... Here's a, th here's, a, here's a thing. So people create content on TinyTap and they create it, like Yad said, for their audience. Okay, they create it in Arabic, they create it in Chinese, they create it in, in different languages and different topics. It's not all math and English. Okay, it can be local history, tradition, Chinese New Year's is coming. You, content that sometimes, that most likely won't get funded to be an ed tech company, but can be created by individual as an interactive uh, activity. and. What we always wanted to achieve is uh, to really get that network effect where someone in China can take uh, content created in the US and just localize it and, and then distribute it over there and have their share. So we always had that edit button that like, so when you publish a game, you can allow people to edit that, but we kept it locally because we said, okay, so if people republish that again, um, how do we do the revenue share then? Because uh, who, who gets what and how do we... So if everything is on NFTs, if you just have an NFT that says this content is mine and someone now owns a part of it and fork it and creates a version of it, a new version that is great for their local audience, local, local students, you can easily distribute all the revenue share to everyone. Uh, you don't need a third party the distributor to, to, to pay everyone and to do all the calculation in the back. And you don't need to trust us. Uh, the company, you just see everything on chain, and you know, um, as we are, it's, it's we're a little bit of a, a, a different bird, I think, in the landscape of Web3 because we have a working product. We have uh, it's very important for people to understand we're an existing company. We have millions of dollars in annual sales from consumers accessing uh, our content, and uh, as we're entering Web3, obviously the first phase is that people will be able to still pay with fiat to access the content. And we're using blockchain kind of the business model and in the back um, to, to, to enable all kind of new uh, opportunities for educators and, and, and partners. But um, very soon, you'll also be able to access the services with crypto. So it will be a full cycle system. I think that's what everybody is kind of waiting to see. So if you own something and someone pays with it with crypto, you see how the money flows. Throughout all the NFTs, you don't need to trust anyone. It's a closed system. I think it's beautiful, and that's what we're building. So, to give you one interesting example of you know what happens when you have you know actual sort of digital sort of you know freedom in the sense of that you have actual digital property rights and the freedom to transact or others to sort of participate in. You know when you know, when they did uh, when TinyTap did their auction. Uh, you know, and, and maybe later on you get will explain the model, but effectively you know the uh, the teaching content basically becomes a kind of financial asset as well, because you're now able to purchase uh, and basically earn through the publishing mechanism, you know, the, the publishing rights, the income from that, which then basically qual qualifies as some kind of yield. Uh, and, you know, whether this is 10%, 20% yield, you know, it gives much more value to the teachers as a result of that, because something that made $1,000 could then be sold maybe for five or $10,000. But the interesting thing was that the typical education model, normally, because it's a walled garden, 
would normally just sell to the intended audience, right? Oh, let's go market and sell it only to, you know, basically parents, perhaps, or maybe a publisher. But actually, the participants in the auction, in some cases, were actually uh, protocols, uh, yield generating protocols, essentially, you know, completely unrelated to the educational market that were saying, hey, you know what? Um, actually, this is a pretty good yield. Why don't we just participate in that? And then actually, instead of basically sort of, you know, giving out inflationary tokens, we actually can invest in a product that actually generates true cash flow generating yield uh, for, for that particular sort of, you know, I guess, uh, protocol. So it's an example of additional participation from third parties that you would never normally expect because of the fact that it essentially, um, you know, is, is, is something that anyone can freely sort of participate in or maybe compose as well. So it's just one yeah. sort of fascinating example where when you open things up, new business opportunities come about. And it kind of makes you think about what the future could look like. Because if you can actually bundle educational content uh, of all sorts, then really maybe you can actually in the future literally go to you know, your bank and you can get yield in sort of you know, how people have green bonds. Well, you can have education bonds perhaps in the future. I mean, of course, that doesn't happen today, but you can see how that could be possible now with an approach like what Tiny Tap has done. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and, and it's, you know, for, for those of us that, uh, that, you know, value the educational process, not always the system, right? Sometimes there's, there's problems with the system. Um, I learned, I learned a few months ago that Josh actually, I, I think I'm getting these correct. Were you the valedictorian of your high school, Josh? Is that correct? That is that is a yeah, true uh, story. Yeah. Not, not not one of those fun facts you share often, but yeah. No, but that's awesome. I mean, it just means it. It just it's just evidence of your sort of caring about the details and you know and working very hard. Wait, wait. How do we know is the valedictorian? Do you have that on chain? Do you have like that is not on chain? It's only it's hearsay based on me, but yeah, we'll yeah. see. <laughs> I, I think that that that's the next evolution. Tiny tap. You got you got to put all this stuff on chain, man. <laughs> on it. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I mean, but yeah, to see to see the educational content, which you know, I myself has created tons of, uh, ha have some value uh, beyond what it's typically had, and and it's it's able to be captured, right? Because I think it's that's one of the things that's happened also in web, web, uh, web two, I guess, web one, is that content is able to be shared, right? You look at the Spotify's and all these, these ways that you can create something that's very valuable and be like, oh, this is really valuable. I'm just going to share it with this person, photocopy and send the PDF and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's like it never happened for the originator, you know, of that content. Um, mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Can I shift the topic to the, the metaverse here? Um, there's, you know, everybody's excited about it. It's a hot word. Like you said, yeah, it's people are talking about all over Davos. Where do we think it's going to gain traction next? Right, there's been these moments and in, in, in initiatives where people uh, get into into the metaverse, various metaverses, sandbox, decentralized, things like that. But there still is more growth ahead. What do we think is going to make that growth occur? Well, okay. So I mean, first, I think when we think about the metaverse from our perspective, we we do we always believe that it starts essentially with you know actual sort of ownership as in digital property rights. Because even if you can experience something, if it's not yours, uh, then actually it's meaningless. And the definition comes from the fact that it, ownership is also a form of self-sovereignty, right? So it has to be real for you. And if it's not real for you, then it's not reality. And if it's not if reality, then, then you know, what does it matter? Right? So that's kind of how we generally sort of look at that. And then VR, AR, and even the screen or the mobile phone, are actually just simply interfaces in which you can basically sort of access your true reality, as it were, which, which starts with, you know, the ownership of yourself. And, you know, assets that you own are part of your identity. For instance. So, that, so that's how we sort of, you know, think of it broadly, which means that all areas can advance this, right? So obviously gaming is still probably one of the biggest onboarders of this because that's one of the ways in which we already have digital identities, right? If we think about how our children interact and play in these games, they actually, you know, are identifying with them as a part of who they are, except they don't own that. And when they do, then, you know, that, that's, that's, that's going to be much more powerful because really their virtual identity, if you think about it, is, is as real as their physical one. Um, and, and they interact maybe not with the same kind of friends, perhaps even in when they play, play in, in online games. Uh, we have to also understand that there's over 3 billion gamers in the world, but there's still only tens of millions of blockchain games, Web3 games. So, the sort of growth 
potential for that actually uh, is, is still in the early innings. But you know, if you take a look, for instance, at something like TinyTap, that's another form of sort of metaversal activity because it's creating real value. It's a user-generated economy. And what actually do we all do, generally speaking, we, even if we don't think of it, and we're actually um, sort of learning in one form or the other. Look at YouTube. YouTube is the largest learning platform in the world, right? But it's really videos. And it's how is it the most largest learning platform? Because actually people create learning content um, you know, that basically mimic things that they know and do well, which is basically how we all generate that. And here, what TinyTap has done is create a platform where they create those kind of learning experiences, but in an interactive uh, manner, as opposed to just a sort of, you know, um, passive way. Uh, so I think, I think, again, that's another way to onboard people. I think of it, uh, I mean, how many families are being served on TinyTap today, you get? Yeah, so you have about 9.3 million registered parents, uh, 350,000 educators out of them, 65,000 uh, creators. So, right. wow. I mean, if you think about onboarding, right? I mean, that's onboarding. When you think about, you know, every person who ends up interacting with this learning content, uh, maybe buying an NFT, having a slice of that, having ownership, um, utilizing it in one form or fashion. Is essentially another form of onboarding, and you know, if there's something that you know we all do on mass, it is learning. So I absolutely think that education has you know that potential as well. Very exciting, and I guess the question that comes to mind next is is for yoga. I mean, what what is next for for Tiny Tap? I mean, uh, you have quite the uh, arsenal to work with here in terms of a captive yeah. audience that. Um, has already into gamified education. So there's so many fun things you can do from here. Yeah, we started with, uh, with the publisher NFT. Um, just to, to, to get everybody mindset on the same page. I know a lot of the people, when they think about NFT, they think about the NFTs the way we've seen them until now. But I want everybody to go back and, 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 and remember the, the core value of NFT, which is ownership. And you can use that for many things. And so the way we use that is to give our teachers an opportunity to mint their content. Now they have an NFT that represents that content and they can invite partners to become co-publishers with them, just like someone wants to publish a book and goes to publishers and now you two are co-owners of an asset. And that's the network effect. The more people that co-own content with you and the more people who care about the success of the platform you have uh, more people to, to help you distribute. So that was the first step for us, creating the publisher NFT, a simple model that allows you in practice to invite people to become co-owners, take that NFT, connect their wallet, and uh, actually get, get a piece of the action in terms of revenue, but also participate in the promotion of it. So that's big as it is enough. And we've saw the first 12, and uh, those the people who purchased the first 12 NFTs are already generating revenue from that. So like Yad said, this isn't about market uh, hype. It's not about whether people are going to appreciate these NFTs in a year or not. It's whether the value behind them is going to increase or not. Whether more people are going to be interested in that kind of content and whether this content can branch into new uh, opportunities. So that's that's the first part we're doing. Um, the, the second part, something we're uh, working on it and uh, hope to launch very, very soon is a way to basically reward uh, educators and kind of brings them on board uh, as the founding community of, of, the, of, of the project of, of, the, of, uh, the edu of education on Web3. We really don't want this to be a tiny top story. This is an education on Web3 story. Uh, in the spirit of Metaverse, we want this to be about interoperability. We want the value of having... Uh, uh, and, and, and NFT that represents that you're part of the com this community to open doors on other platforms, not only on TinyTap. And um, I've, I've mentioned before, um, for us as an existing company that already has a running product, which is built on creators, Web3 is already solving problems. So revenue share, much easier with NFTs than working with third parties and sending magic links to PayPal and withdrawing it, much easier. As another problem it's solving and that we're going to introduce now to the even to the to, to the consumer side is the opportunity where you go to our website and you purchase a subscription or uh or you or you purchase a course. You can either purchase a subscription to give you access to a library of content, or you can pay to access a specific course. That's a business model on TinyTap. 
normally we would once you finish the onboarding we'll give you a a direction to go and download the app connect you to your email and password and and and, and get access and a lot, a lot of the time people forget forget their email and password and how to log in and it's confusing because you bought it on the web and you need to log in on the app so what if you just get an nft that says you have that and you have it in your wallet and then you connect on the app and that's it the wallet is there um, it also helps with uh, integration with uh, with other companies. We are now working with a few private schools. We're going to give TinyTap to their uh, um, to their thousands of, of of students. And normally, their company needs to talk to our servers and tell them this email and password. Just purchase a subscription. Open the the app for them. You can simplify that and just give them a, an NFT in the wallet, and they can connect with that. So this is exactly what Yat was talking about. You're bringing the internet with you. Instead of the internet being on different servers, talking above you as if you're a child, you are the one who have the, the, the identification that says, hey, I have this. If you respect that, give me the service. And you can take that to different services that respect that without those companies doing much integration. So we're going to be the, um, the first company to really um, honor and give you different discounts and perks for uh, having this uh, NFT for uh, for the teacher community, mm. but obviously we want other communities to to kind of join and support uh, that NFT. So this is the next step, really a big project to kind of reward uh, educators online. Uh, we're we're welcoming our educators and we're wel welcoming educators from Teachers Pay Teachers, from Udemy, from any other platforms to come and join and kind of lead the way. That is the key. Well, really, instead of companies leading the way. We want educators leading the way and we want to build the tools for them to do that. Cool. Oh man, very exciting stuff. Um, I want to get to a, a question here. We mentioned earlier, Jeff's not able to make it, but he was able to share a question um, and uh, he may have gotten it from chat GPT. I don't know, but um, here's Jeff's question. <laughs> it's for, it's for, uh, yeah, mostly I think here. And he's saying, what, what does Animoca Brands roadmap look like going forward? Um, uh, we know how active you were in the previous bear market, both building and investing in partnerships and acquisitions. Can we expect similar activity? And is there anything in particular we should look out for? So generally speaking, Animoca Brands is continuing to invest and build. I mean, I think if you look at our most recent announcement, I think we've more sort of, I think, you know, probably within ourselves and uh, Japan operation, for instance, I think two or three investments uh, just in the last couple of weeks, for instance. So, you know, that is still actually fairly active. I think one of the reasons why the investment pace may appear to be a little slower than the start of basically a year ago actually has a lot to do with the quantum of companies that are actually fundable as well. Because there's quite a few companies out there that actually probably don't meet the bar um, as the funding climate has changed, for instance. Uh, but also, I think what's exciting is, is that the number of people actually submitting uh, sort of, you know, investment propositions has actually declined as well, because for those who actually are serious, they're looking, but there's a whole bunch of companies out there, frankly speaking, who are, you know, uh, who, who, who may have had sort of some doubts before about the space, and they were just looking at an opportunity to raise money, but were serious, those guys are all out, right? So I think in some ways, you know, a shakeout in the market is always very healthy, uh, because it basically shows you who are the true builders, and who's, you know, who are the ones who are actually really here to, to do stuff. Uh, and the focus really for 2023 continues still to be the same principle as before. Basically, anything that sort of adds to network effects of entities or basically helps in the onboarding of that. And so to bring, bring it back a little bit to TinyTap, which was something that we had done actually last year, it's a perfect example of maybe it's a new segment. It has an intersection of gaming because teachers can make games. But actually, really, it addresses a completely new market that can actually onboard an entirely new audience of, um, of, uh, of, of basically a community into Web3. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, and and um, maybe one difference is that we've, you know, from maybe when we first did this podcast, we were basically sort of, you know, running everything, let's say ourselves. Uh, we're much smaller as an organization. And today Animoco Brands has sort of professionalized itself a fair bit. You know, we have a ventures team, a capital team, Right. So on one hand, uh, that means we have more processes and more, more, more sort of, I guess, um, you could argue some level of bureaucracy. On the other hand, I guess you have also more diligence and you have actually more capabilities within the team. So, so that's sort of, you know, all part of maturing. 
One thing that we have done more now, uh, which, you know, last year, actually more than a year ago, we didn't have, was, you know, we would have the partner days, for instance, I mean, like, have animal gatherings, right? And these are basically the uh, sort of places where portfolio companies come together, learn from each other, do business with each other, and also learn best practices from various companies, um, including our group companies um, as well. And so that's that's sort of a forum that we've now started to set up as well. So so getting getting better at basically sort of knowledge sharing. Uh, and maybe just finally on that point, one way for the in sort of our portfolio community to participate is basically through what we now basically define as you know, the Mochaverse. Right? And the Mochaverse basically is a is a collection of membership NFTs uh, that, uh, but it goes beyond that. But basically, it allows the community to have participation in the Animoca ecosystem, not just through you know joining our events or whatever, but also to maybe have participation. Uh, in DAO votes, basically, because we have, you know, a large treasury uh, of tokens that could be used in, for instance, DAO voting as a result of that. But we're being very thoughtful about how it's being distributed. So basically, you know, our investors, as well as sort of, you know, portfolio companies, uh, group companies, employees, so that it becomes really, really sort of uh, distributed and, and decentralized, given given what's at stake with, with the right audience. So these are yeah. some of the things that we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, um, you know, we should disclose we are part of that family and, and a proud member of the family and excited to be part of Mochaverse. We've we've shared some special perks associated with our upcoming event, um, which by this time when folks are listening, they'll, they'll hear some of the updates on the theme for the year, which will be really exciting. And one of the other things we're doing with our event this year is we are focusing on education. So, 9 a.m. on um, each day, uh, we're going to have three workshops on on Tuesday and Wednesday. And yeah, you probably don't know this, but Mohammed has graciously put in, uh, raised his hand to to teach a, a tokenomics and rewards workshop uh, for for the LA community and those that attend. So it'll be a full hour workshop um, to start the day for people that really want to dive into this stuff because. I think, you know, the theme of this episode um, and my big takeaway is just the power of, of education to sort of amplify the space and to um, help sort of our society in general, right? And, and so we really want to double down on that. Um, talks are fun, parties are fun, uh, art's fun, music's fun, but we also need to take a step back and, and really uh, reflect on this past year and a half of 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 adventures and, and start to put this into practice as a practical applications of the technology like tiny tap um, so impressed uh, you get with what you're doing in that area so um congrats and, and looking forward to to seeing where it goes from here i'd love to ask both you gentlemen um since you know we're all in this space we're all looking around and, and seeing what's happening and there's there's projects that we're um, more intimately connected to than others but um, what are the projects that you're seeing out there right now that, that get you excited outside of the ones that we've already talked about? Yeah, so um, for me, um, one project that I'm following and um, very closely is the uh, Royal IO. Um, so basically from Three Lao, trying to do something similar to what we're trying to do with education, just with music, uh, allowing the, the fans and the participants to be uh, uh, owners and uh, and, and work with the artists on on uh, on their uh, songs. There's a lot of challenges to, to overcome do, uh, in doing that, um, both on the artist side, both on the legal sides. And um, I'm I'm paying close attention. Royal.io. That's one project I'm interested in. Cool. And and yeah, what are, what about you? And anything that you know, even out uh, like you guys have your hands in so many of these leading projects, but anything sort of outside yeah, of your so <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take it from a slightly different lens because it's a little bit like sort of um, asking you know what's your, you know who's your favorite child, right? Um, so that's kind of tough um, because we're excited about everything, of course, right? Uh, but I think the one thing that you know it's not within a project space, but and this may sound a little awkward, but I'm kind of excited about what we're seeing in the development of regulation. Right? And that seems sort of awkward because like, oh, isn't regulation something that is going to stifle and is it going to be too bureaucratic? But actually, you know, one of the things that I feel quite strongly, and this is a, a thematic in, in Davos now uh, that we see as well, um, and maybe inspired by that, is that one of the reasons why I think many countries didn't regulate on, on you know, 
crypto fungible tokens and I don't think non fungible tokens are within the realm, but as we know, the transaction system basically for non fungible tokens is broadly crypto, so it is important, um, is because they didn't want to give it validity. So the whole idea of not regulating was essentially to say that thing's not really real anyway. So let's just not talk about that. And, and if you know there's a problem, then it's not really our problem, but you know, we gave you a buyer's beware. Uh, because you know it's going to go away, so why bother? And the thematic right now, throughout the world, and very much as you know, in Davos with the world scene, is it's here to stay, right? So as bearish as some people might want to be, basically the world has now recognized that Web three is here to stay. The metaverse, as in, in its Web three narrative, is real, and we need to find a way in which we can play and support its growth. So that gets me really excited because this is macro, right? And you can see this effect already happening in places like Asia, for instance, where Japan, uh, you know, the prime minister announced Web3 in the metaverse as part of its national growth agenda. And Hong Kong basically came out in late October with a digital and virtual asset policy, which then basically ended up not only in some companies getting licenses within the same year, but by the end of 2022, just two months after their announcement, launched on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, the first Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF. You know, so, so, you know, it just goes to show that what's happening in the outside area that will affect Web3, I think, in a very positive manner, um, um, what, what's happening in regulatory framework, because then once you have that, you have more safety and you have more security, and that means more participation. So, you know, of things outside of our ecosystem, I would say that will have probably one of the biggest impacts, positive impacts to our industry, and we're excited about that. Yeah. Here, here for regulation. Here, here for regulation. <laughs> You have questions about blockchain? Like, how big of a block can you chain without throwing out your back? Or, if you received that chain letter, how did you block it? And does blockchain taste better, barbecued, or deep fried? <laughs> Luckily, you don't have to ponder these quandaries alone anymore, because Blockchain Training Alliance is here to answer them, and also train you in real-world blockchain issues that will impact your business's bottom line and orient it future forward along the ley lines of the most important tech humanity has perfected since harnessing atomic energy. If you're into those sorts of things, Blockchain Training Alliance is a top leader in the field, counting among its clients IBM, Microsoft, Disney, Morgan Stanley, and many more, and offering a wide array of technical and non-technical courses. Whether you're a computer neophyte training for an incredible career in this new space, or a coding expert honing your skills, Blockchain Training Alliance will help you steer your ship home safely, filled with treasure. <laughs> Arg. So hurry and sign up for the Blockchain Training Alliance course that best fits your needs at blockchaintrainingalliance.com. Use discount code EDGEOF for 50% off and start your next block today. So uh, that has been an incredible conversation, guys, so far. Now, our next segment typically is Edge Quick Hitters, and it will be our next segment again. We actually already have asked yet at our Edge hit Quick Hitter question, so we'll probably turn the focus over here to you, Gev. Um, but, uh, but let's do it. Sound good? Everybody ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it. So edge quick hitters, just to clarify here, quick, a fun, quick way to get to know you a little bit better. 10 quick questions that we're looking for. Just a short, single or few word response, but feel free to expand if you get the urge. All right, so here and, we go. And, and maybe Ethan, we should, um, you know, it's it's past midnight for Yat. Maybe we should give him a chance to say adieu. If, <laughs> adieu, if, yes, if, if he if, wants, yeah. If, if he needs to head head to sleep before another busy day in Davos. That's true, we, yeah. We totally uh, will understand that. No, thank you so much. Uh, it's actually 1 a.m. here, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll call it a night. But All thank right. you so much for having me and uh, look forward to the next time. And uh, keep up the good work you give. I think uh, what Tiny Tap is doing is is incredible. Yeah, it's been I pleasure, look forward, yeah. Look for, yeah, look forward to seeing you yet um, in, in a couple of weeks in, in March. Bye. Right. Catch you later. All right, you give. Here we go. What is the first thing you ever remember purchasing in your life? Ever remember purchasing? Uh, that's got to be a plastic dinosaur for $2 that I got from my grandma at age nine, I guess. Yeah, because that dino survived all the way through high school. And I bought it when I was like in the first grade or something. So I remember that dime, that uh, $2. I guess. Nice. Some that's durable not, plastic. That, durable that is plastic. not a cheap dinosaur, <laughs> by the way. 
which by the way is the, is the name of a friend of mine's chiptune band cheap dinosaurs cheap look guys. it up <laughs> well, all right next logo, yeah like no good 80s uh, toys nice okay. next question is what is the first thing you remember ever selling in your life that's a really good question and a really proud moment of my life so um in the sixth grade. So I'm an illustrator, I'm a designer, that's my passion. And so in the sixth grade, I think I, um, you, you remember the garbage pile? Of course. Garbage yeah, pile garbage pile kids. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, garbage pile kids. So I was a big fan, I collected all the cards. And so I, in my, in my class, I mean, uh, in the grade, we had 76 kids. I made a garbage pile kid out of every one of them. I drew a doodle of them. My mom, went and made copies of them at, at school. I cut them out, put them in packages. And me and my friend used to go in the lunch break and sell them in packages to the kids themselves. So they would collect cards of themselves. They were sold like for very cheap, but we made decent money for sixth graders. And uh, I remember this one kid managed to, we gave them albums. So this one kid managed to collect all the cards, complete an album, and he won a firecracker. So that was... My, my first kind of entrepreneurship uh, moment. Impressive. Very cool. All right. So what is the most recent thing you purchased? <laughs> uh, this guy, <laughs> an iPhone uh, Pro 14, but uh, yeah, that or uh, yeah, I guess uh, this iPhone 14 Pro, I was just, I just were in a vacation last week and I, and I got that. Also got a Boss headphones with it. If you guys are on AirPods, I love Apple. I'm an Apple fan, fanboy, but Boss AirPods are would blow your mind. Try them out. I, I've been thinking about snagging some of those. That's that's worth uh, worth considering. All right. So, what is the most recent thing you sold? Um, I guess uh, twelve publisher NFTs <laughs> on Tiny Tap. All right. That is that is a qualified response. That sounds about right. It is. It is it's a business response, I guess, on the personal <laughs> level. On the personal level, what I've sold, I guess, my kids' puzzles, and uh, so something like that. Yeah, when they uh, when he finished them, he just uh, I remember selling that. That was the last one, like six or eight boxes, to another happy uh, four year old or something like that. Very nice to recycle those toys. Yes. All right. Next question, number five. What is your most prized possession? Other, other than my two cats. Other than my two cats. Uh, that works. Yeah, two cats, but uh, really my bicycle. I use my bicycle to work every day in the past 10 years. So that's what I like most about living in Tel Aviv. It's a flat city, very easy to move around with bicycles. I don't, I don't think you guys have that in LA. Uh, yet, but the... yeah, not so, not so much unless you want to get creamed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when I was hanging out with you in Venice Beach, though, Josh, they had the scooters rolling around. That was fun. Yeah, so they were there for a while. I mean, um, obviously, biking <laughs> on the board so far away, you know, you need a car. You can get away from. Yeah, it. yeah. I lived in LA for a while. You need a car. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Um. All right, next question here, after what's your most prized possession. Uh, if you could buy something in the world, anything in the world, digital, physical, service, or experience that is currently for sale, what would it be? Time off. <laughs> uh, for me, just a simple sketchbook is, 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 all, is all I need, really. I need much and, and some time to doodle in it. Um, other than that, I am considering getting the next, uh, the latest uh, Oculus Pro from Facebook. I want to give that a, a go. I'm a big fan of VR. I've been following that since inception. Cool. Yeah. By the way, for, for any of the listeners that don't realize that, so we have this amazing library near us where they where you can check out toys, which is really cool. Like they have puzzles and games and all this stuff for the kids, puppets, like all kinds of stuff. And my son found this little packet and he just kind of picked it random. We didn't really know what was in. We brought it home and it had this little VR goggles in it and these books for learning, you know, just kind of, we're talking about learning here mm -hmm. and you could go in and you could explore outer space or like, look at how a fireman does his job. But the cool thing about it is um, there are these VR goggles. Well, all you have to do is you take your phone and you put it inside 
And there's a program that basically just makes your phone into a set of VR goggles when it's inside like this little box. Like they're very inexpensive uh, and very cool. Uh, so yeah, I remember that. The Google used to do that. Like Cardboard. Google did it called Google Cardboard. cardboard. Yeah. yeah, but going back to your question, I, um, I got to share that I'm a big... I'm a big Back to the Future fan, actually. Um, in 2021, I had the pleasure of opening WWDC from Apple. You know, the event that they do every year? Oh, wow. So Apple invited me. I participated in this fun videos that they do when the event opens. So go to YouTube, look for WWDC 2021. You'll see me in the first frame. And the idea that I gave them was basically to put Tim Cook, to Tim Cook in a DeLorean coming out, holding the next iPhone from the future. And they did that. They reenacted that. They brought, <laughs> they brought a, an actor doing that. So if I could buy anything, a hoverboard or a DeLorean, I'll be a really happy uh, camper. Yeah. So there's a there's a new DeLorean coming out um, where it, it's tied ah, to a... The electric did... one. I remember some tweets yeah. about it. Did that actually happen? I, I, I haven't checked into it, but but I did meet the crew and they were going to tie it to a digital uh, twin NFT um, and the NFT holds your production spot. So pretty cool. Mm, OK, yeah. So so that I'll take the electric. <laughs> there you okay. go. All right. Well, if you could pass on one of your personality traits to the next generation, what one would it be? Uh, creativity. That's one thing that is very dear to my heart um you know how there are people are saying i'm i'm not a math person that kind of annoys me uh, just as i hear people saying i'm not a creative person because you know defining yourself is is such a bad trait and it's basically people defining you and it's killing a lot of people's creativity and um that's that's what i really like to see about people and i want them to, to really uh, explore their innovation and creativity and basically avoid titles. I mean, I studied art and design in the Bessalel Academy of Art and Design. When I did that, um, while I was in school, I thought the entire world was created by designers because we were kept you know, solving those creative briefs. And then I got out and a lot of my friends just deemed them, themselves designers. So you're not your job, you're not your title. You can do anything you want. You're just learning traits and picking up skills along the way. So. That's what I, I wish love for it. everyone, creativity and, and, and freedom of, of, of self-definition. I love it. I love it. And if you could eliminate one of your personality traits from the next generation, what one would it be? Um, definitely want to be a, a better listener, to learn how to listen better, um, to be attentive. I think a lot of us in the innovative space uh, have a bit of an ADHD, a bit of, uh, you know, um, all over the place, enjoying l listening to a lot about, about, about uh, different ideas. So um, focusing a little bit, hearing more, listening, not just hearing, but really listening. That's what I would wish for myself. I like that. All yeah. right, next question. Uh, what did you do just before joining us on the podcast? Uh, coffee because it's 2 a.m. right now. So <laughs> that's, that's what I did. And uh, doodling on my uh, Remarkable too. I don't know if you guys oh, know. Oh, nice. It. I've it's got a Remarkable product. pad, yeah. It allows you to doodle on ink. Uh, I think it's from Norwegian. I'm not sure. It's a Finnish company. Amazing product right on my nose. So I just wrote like the highlights of, of what we're doing that I want to emphasize on the show. So coffee and doodling. Beautiful. Um, and then final uh, question, uh, what are you going to do after joining us on the podcast? So not everybody know, but in Israel, uh, Thursday is when the weekend starts. I mean, Friday and Saturday, we're off. And then Saturday, Sunday, it's a work day. We're starting the week. So just when we're going to say goodbye, it means my weekend begins. Okay. So I'm going to give myself another hour, maybe Netflix. I don't know. It's going to be wild. Okay, beautiful. Now for today, because it felt on theme, I asked Chat GPT to come up with a uh, with a bonus question uh, for today. Uh, it gave me one, and then I said, "Try another one that's a little bit more outlandish." So I'll give you two questions <laughs> that Chat GPT came up with. Uh, first, and you could answer either of them or both if you want. But uh, first question would be, "What is the best piece of advice you've ever received?" The second one would be if you were given the opportunity to, to live on a different planet, which planet would you choose and why? Oh, 
<laughs> Planet is more interesting, actually. <laughs> Planet. Uh, water world. Uh, so I'm a scuba diver. I love corals and reefs and sea animals. And I love the, the latest Avatar too. I know a lot of people have different opinions, but the visuals and the water world just uh, is fascinating. So I guess Pandora would be an amazing place to, to visit. Cool. All right. Well, that was Edge Quick Hitters. Thank you so much for uh, having some fun with us on that one. Hey there, NFT Space Cadet. Let's zoom in on the globe from outer space today to Abbott Kinney Boulevard in Venice Beach, LA. Let me show you a cosmic tech beacon that shines out among the bustle of fashion, art, and food there. It's a thriving software dev, data science, and design studio known as AE Studio where scores of the sharpest minds have come together to help founders and execs create software and machine learning solutions that are not only profitable and increase our agency as humans, but that give us that warm, fuzzy feeling that elegant tech so wonderfully does. AE's breadth of talent allows them to build anything from instillvideo.com, it's a health, fitness, and wellness app that makes your chakras tingle, to award-winning brain-computer interface solutions that could quite literally bend our minds. Oh, and keep an eye out for Token Runners, their NFT white label marketplace, as well as our highly anticipated NFT drop, Boomer NFT. Now, for all you DGENs who strive to shed the cummerbund and pearls, comes a jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring partnership not seen since the heyday of Shaq and Kobe. It's called Edge of AE Studio and you can find out all about it at edgeofae.com. That's right, this full service, soup to nuts, end to end, whole enchilada NFT service can help you, yes you Randy, launch your NFT project. Edge of NFT and AE Studio have come together like Voltron to get your project in gear so you can hightail it straight to the moon, stardom, and maybe even your own private yacht. Go to edgeofae.com to find out more. That's edgeofae.com. Actual results may vary depending on moon landing location, domain of stardom, scale and model of yacht, as well as weather scale model of yacht or actual yacht. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here because because we know you have to get to relaxing and sleeping soon. But let's uh, before we jump off, where can listeners go to learn more about you and the projects you're working on? Yeah, so uh on Twitter, right now we're on Twitter. Uh, go to uh, look for Tiny Top AB. So that's Tiny Top Animoca Brands, Tiny Top AB. Um, you should follow us to hear when we're launching new project and progressing with our project. And if you want to follow uh, a different type of project on Web3, definitely do that. Um, if you want to get some information on what we've done so far and, and, and see for yourself, go to web3.tinytap.com. Web3 that tinytap.com and uh and play around and you know just get the app get tiny tap start creating content uh, if you're uh you don't have to be an educator we didn't really talk about it but it's a free tool it's completely free to create download it for the ipad create content for your own children or for any uh any cause really it doesn't have to be for kids really. yeah Give it i can't time. wait i'm excited all right well thank you so much yogev and also of course Thank you to Yat, who's who had to to leave us to tell get some of his own sleep. We have reached the outer limit at the edge of NFTs for today. Thanks for exploring with us. We've got space for more adventures on this starship. So invite your friends and recruit some cool strangers that will make this journey all so much better. How? Go to Spotify or iTunes right now. Rate us and say something awesome. Then go to edgeofnft.com to dive further down the rabbit hole. Look us up on all major social platforms by typing edge of NFT with no spaces and start a fun conversation with us online. Lastly, be sure to tune in next time for more great Web3 content. Thanks again for joining us and sharing this time today. The views and opinions expressed on the Edge of NFT podcast reflect solely those views and opinions of the show creators and its guests. We're learning as we go just like you. Please make sure to do your own research. Our podcast is not financial advice. There are multiple strategies and not all strategies fit all people. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk.